Alright, another draft science video presentation. So, just the general subject we're back to, I suppose. Um, the idea is I have to find a way to make this argument, present the argument to the people responsible, eh, the people with authority, um, to get a counter-argument of some kind. And um, so far, so bad at that process. I was thinking of offering the money to a forum, um, you know, like one of the popular forums of arrogant douchebags, um, and just to see, you know, where they can't delete it, you know, I'll pay them the money, but they just can't delete the thread as they keep doing, or close the thread. Um, you know, to buy an unclosable thread on a forum, I wonder if they'll go for it. Um, you know, because they don't make much money, frankly. Um, compared to these video producers, the popular video producers, uh, who still don't make all that much money, right? Um, where $2,000 shouldn't be an enticement. But as was demonstrated with the Ken Wheeler, we know how much Ken Wheeler loves money. And, um, you know, he won't take the two grand because he knows he's not going to be able to, his, his shit is going to look a lot shittier, okay, when it's... Um, compared to something else. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is a real dilemma of, you know, getting my my opportunity to interrogate physics in some form or to at least show it um, tripping over its own feet and all that kind of stuff. Um, to show just how little evidence they have. To have a real public trial just to show that it is just a religion. Um, it's just based on a bunch of assumptions, and they never really thought about it in any kind of deep way. Uh, and, um, you know, it's all based a lot of faith-based kind of notions of, you know, we believe because we have a tiny reason to believe. And we have a huge, giant reason not to believe if we actually thought about it for 10 or 15 minutes. Sort of like religion. Um, and it doesn't take much thinking. I mean, you know, you sit there, you know, I was, I was just playing with the bowling ball numbers, you know, and reducing it down from 16 and, and 8 is the velocity. And, you know, that would be a 128 joules, you would say, of energy. Now, their theory says 512. Well, that's not too bad, right? But when you get down here, it's 128, right, versus... <laughs> 62,914. So as soon as I start making it, you know, one-eighth of a pound, the um, projectile is going faster than the speed of sound, and it has 62,000 joules. Uh, 62,000. So 62,000 and 128, that's a pretty big discrepancy. So obviously this huge, insane bias towards speed, more joules than the, the, the explosive can even produce. Um, it clearly is free energy. It clearly doesn't make any sense. Uh, yet I have to sit there and, you know, I have to sit here and make this aggressive argument to do all of this aggressive work to get a rational scientist to explain how <clears throat> this isn't just a paradox. It isn't just paradoxically silly that I could make things lighter and lighter and somehow I can gain much more energy in the particle being expelled by an explosion than the actual whole explosion actually produces. Um, yeah, just nonsense. Uh, it can't happen that way. The momentum number is correct. Um, it's all the same momentum. It's all the same capacity to produce, in the end, heat. So I suppose that's a... You know, before I start, I might as well do the little bits that I think of, and I say, gee, I should emphasize that point because, you know, it's really important. And I have stated it in a previous video, but I probably should state it with um, a little more clarity and a little more directly, because it is an interesting part of, you know, the history and how this might have, you know, where you, where you can say, well, this is where that you could see where they could make a mistake and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, you can make excuses for um, misperceptions or something. So there's this idea that the energy just, you know, you can't kill energy. You can only transform it. So the energy is moving through this system. And it's hard to just keep that in your head when you're thinking about a bowling ball knocking down pins. You're not really thinking 
that ultimately all of the energy is going to be converted into heat. Heat will be a by byproduct of the collision um, unless you can do something like the kinetic balls where you can reduce the amount of heat because you have transferred the energy so completely, like 99% of it. So, and then you can say, okay, I didn't make any heat yet. You know, but you know that ball is going to do something in the environment. Or it's going to fight gravity, right? So, and again, I would sort of argue that gravity does create heat ultimately in objects. That's why the Earth has a molten center. Um, so when the kinetic ball goes up against gravity, you could argue, okay, <laughs> that it's um, getting hotter because gravity is using friction stopping it from moving but it would be such a slight amount that you probably can't measure it um, you know and it, it's dissipated into you know the environment so quickly that you couldn't measure it but regardless um, you know that would be the, the that would be a, a logical symptom of the fact that you've taken the velocity away um, so anyway so the idea is, is that no matter what you collide into what, um, <clears throat> I've probably said it well enough that, uh, well, you know, who knows. <laughs> so, so the idea is, is whether you have a car crash, right, you could do it that way. Because they, they did, you know, they preposterously exaggerate what happens, you know, in this circumstance. You know, by adding speed, using their kinetic energy formula, they turn an accident that has you know, whatever, 10,000 joules into one that has 1,674 joules of energy. When, again, it's just momentum. It's just weights and speed. And, again, speed just means that you go through something quicker, okay, because you are in contact with, with less time. You're spending less time in contact with it, which means any piece that bounces, you know, reflects all the reflected energy, you're not going to feel it if you're going fast enough because there isn't time for it to get to you. So all the energy you're creating, all the heat, all the other stuff that would come back and hit you and, you know, deter your progress, take more energy from you, those collisions don't happen the faster you're going. So you can sort of understand, like, it's almost like you can't hit anything. You know, if you go fast enough, you're hitting stuff and it's moving forward of your hitting it. And that stuff all moving forward of you hitting it is basically moving the stuff to a further away location, meaning it's easier for you to go through the material because you're hitting less of it. Um, and the slower you're going, the more all of this stuff is going to stay around and cause you um, to lose more of your energy to all of these incidental crashes going sideways. Well, anyway, so the point is, is that, you know, when you go into the, the crash, some pieces will fly off and and um, so they're new projectiles and what's going to happen is they're going to hit the ground and bounce and do different things and maybe they hit a wall or something else and they're just going to keep losing their energy as heat to the environment so even just flying through the air is a problem because you're hitting a bunch of atoms in the air and you know moving them about and so those are all transfers of your energy and so you eventually lose all your energy to heat so no matter what happens, it's all leaving, <laughs> in a sense, in heat, if <clears throat> in a con in a form of heat, because of the fact that we do live in uh, an atmosphere, and the environment just absorbs movement and eventually kills it. Nothing, you know, nothing can just keep going in atmosphere. Um, so it's going to lose it just to the atmosphere itself, and then the mechanisms for absorbing and like even springs, springs get a little bit hot. So each time the spring compresses, it heats the spring. Um, and that heat is just a piece of parts of the momentum. That's part of the momentum getting eaten up. So eventually all of the movement will be heat. But the parts that are, like I said, you have the illusion that you're retaining the energy because pieces are moving and stuff is getting bent and different things are happening that don't look like heat. That, that obviously aren't heat yet. So it just has to do with how f soon you convert the energy into heat, how soon, it'll, how quickly it'll be before it. So there'll be some stuff, as soon as you bend the piece of metal, ah, you made some heat. So some heat will be produced really quickly, 
and then some, like I said, pieces that fly straight up in the air or something and come back down. It could be, you know, a matter of quite a while, seconds after the crash, that the other pieces start losing the energy to heat. So it can take a while for some of the pieces to eventually turn into heat, but it's all going to turn into heat eventually. And I think that's part of what confused people, besides the other made a mess earlier. But in the 1800s, they started realizing that heat was a byproduct of this movement thing and this momentum thing. And I think they were thinking the heat was somehow separate from the momentum, you know, like it was some equal and opposite force or something, rather than understanding it's an actual conversion of the momentum. That the the byproduct of, first you cut the metal, so you also, you get the movement of the metal, uh, or some other example, um, the, the breaking little pieces off of something, um, shattering a glass, so you get the idea that the glass breaks, and so you get the idea that there's some heat in the process of crushing something or smashing something, but pieces of it are moving around, so you're thinking the, the movement is still conserved when, no, part of the movement's been absorbed by the heat, and then part of the movement will be absorbed by the new heat created by the little particles moving and hitting new things and creating heat. So again, in, a, in an environment that is, you know, in an environment that ha it has a thickness to it, okay, a thick environment, it'll all convert to heat. You just won't be allowed to send some piece into space and it orbits the Earth and it stays, it keeps its velocity. And so you have a, some of the jewels will escape um, the fact that the Earth is going to, is a, is a thermal sink. It just, it just sinks all of the m movement and converts it essentially all in some sense or another. It forces it to be trans, it forces it into heat and then the heat can be recreated back into some kind of, you know, you put it in a boiler and then you can create a train that moves down a track. So you can convert the heat into movement again. Um, but the, the fact is, is that it's going to go into that form will be the result of whatever 99.99% of the total crash will be heat. <laughs> okay. And yes, you'll have deformed metal, but the deformed metal didn't cost you anything. It really wasn't. The deformed metal was just you taking a piece of the car and moving it to a new location. And the byproduct of that was you created heat. <laughs> okay, but it's a byproduct. You did actually move the metal. So you're moving, you're crushing the metal in a sense for free. And the heat is just uh, like throwing a particle off its joules of energy. You know, when you break a piece off and it flies, well, the same thing as if you just move it. It doesn't make any difference whether you're moving it or you're throwing it. The throwing was free. That didn't cost anything. Because the cost was really the fact that you heated the environment, you threw it through. You heated the atmosphere. So, the throwing is free. And the heat that's created is just a new kind of... You're saying this is a new piece of momentum. And that new piece of momentum, the piece flying off has its own, you know, the, the same rule applies. It will lose the momentum to heat. It won't lose the momentum because it's moving. It'll lose the momentum because it's moving in an environment where it's hitting a bunch of stuff and giving them momentum, which we see as heat. So heat is just little things moving. So you can just think of it as everything's bowling pins. We see the big pieces, but there's a bunch of little pins, okay, and the little pins are heat. And so every time one of the big pins moves in atmosphere um, or in an environment that has surfaces for it to bang into, there's a bunch of little bowling pins on the surface. And those little bowling pins, are is the movement of them is going to be where all the energy eventually goes. So you're eventually going to move a bunch of little bowling pins, and then those little bowling pins are going to keep moving. The heat's going to keep moving through the material, the movement. And eventually you can capture a bunch of that. You can create some sort of funnel. Okay, you capture the heat. And you reconvert it back into a bowling ball rolling towards pins. You know, that kind of thing. So, the, the heat isn't the byproduct. It is the end product, in a sense. 
and as an end product it's not an end product it's just a form of little pins <coughs> doing the same thing the big pins were doing which is moving and then you can convert that into more movement I think that's close enough yeah well uh, you either got it or you didn't get it all right so uh, that's the only new thing <laughs> yeah call that a new thing uh, all right so let's read some of what I've written as a I'm thinking of the outline how to outline this argument I really want to do it in some sort of modern way to make an argument where um, somebody only has to read what they need to read so you make an argument and you say well you either believe this or you don't believe this you either understand that the Eddington experiment wasn't well performed or you don't you know that's not very good evidence um, because it's never been duplicated with better technology and it certainly hasn't been done from space where there's 400 times better resolution and you might even believe the argument that it actually has been done from space and the results were totally unconclusive and therefore they decided not to publish them or say anything about it because they you know evaded the fact that hey it doesn't seem to work and they just ran from that controversy um, pretty much. I mean, it's hard to believe NASA hasn't done anything resembling the Eddington experiment, um, you know, in, from space. Like I said, you, with 400 times better resolution, technically, to make the experiment just as difficult, you could use 400 times less of a telescope, which almost means you could use a really, really bad, you know, cheapest camera you could buy on eBay or something like a 50 cent um, spy camera or something you know with 200 by 400 resolution um, 400 times is huge so if you even just did it you know if you just cut that in half and said I'll make the technology half as good um, you're still way up you're still way ahead in the sense you still have 200 times better resolution I mean it's a gigantic advantage um, so you're taking a difficult experiment making it almost so simple you know so it's so clear that you almost don't have to squint your eyes at all to see it that's how well it should that's how easy it should be to see from space and um you know it's a it's a you know, i'm just saying those are so those arguments are only needed if somebody is belligerent against the, just the basic argument that yeah I understand that physics could cut corners and that they could um, you know propagandize that they could take a tiny piece of evidence and make it into a huge piece of evidence that these kinds of exaggerations of the importance of a piece of evidence could be possible that they could find something and just totally misinterpret it and pervert it into a whole theory you know like they find some gold cross in Ireland or something and then they make up a whole story about Rome and, you know, how the Romans lived there for 400 million years and, you know, killed all the, the peasants. And, you know, they can make up a whole story out of one artifact that some guy might have just put in his basement, you know, because he bought it at a dime store. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I'm just saying there's layers to the argument that people who have... It, it just gets into the thing like am I to write this for a sixth grader <clears throat> or a tenth grader or a college graduate or you know who's it written for and you know it, it's sort of annoying if you're a smart person to have to read a book that has all these trivial arguments in it um, the ones you already know you know that kind of thing so that's just my point is that it'd be nice to be able to construct an argument uh, in a form that doesn't presume the reader to be an idiot and so he can he can read 10 pages rather than 400 pages because he already knows all the crap that underlies the argument the obvious stuff um, something like that anyway so um, so anyway so yeah I'm just struggling with how to make the argument I mean videos are kind of easy right and when you have comments then you have feedback and you can argue with the comments and blah 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 um, but somehow that interaction fails in the modern age which is just again I've sort of argued that we all should be a little bit troubled by that somehow that um, there really isn't any um, 
give and take feedback in any kind of decent form on the internet. I mean, all there are are um, producers and trolls, and there's nothing else. And you know, and it's uh, there's somehow nobody is willing to engage. Like you can see this in the dissident community. There's no real engagement between people. Um, no capacity to gain the benefit of each other's critiques. Um, and part of that's because people are, um, they're not very good at, at realizing what the process is, which is you're really trying to show the, the strength of arguments. You're really trying to compare them. You're almost forcing the comparison for the purpose of showing what a good argument looks like and what you know, crappy evidence looks like. Even just weighing evidence is a tricky task, right? I mean, how how good is the piece of evidence that you use to convict somebody of a crime, for example? And yeah, if you have a videotape where he's, you know, mugging for the camera and doing selfies um, over the dead body, um, well, that's pretty probably pretty good evidence, right? I mean, that's the kind you can really feel good about. But if all you have is like, all right, well, there's a 1 in 10,000 DNA profile. So, you know, his profile is pretty narrow. You know, 1 in 10,000 people it would match. Well, that's a pretty close match. But, I mean, you know, some cities have millions of people in them. Gee, it is possible it could be a mistake. You know, it could just be that somebody with the same... You know, they had a guy in Philadelphia that was like some sort of kissing bank bandit or something. I mean, he robbed banks and I don't remember what he did. He kissed them or he tipped his hat or he did some kind of silly thing. And they ended up arresting, you know, a guy who looked just like him. It is a fact he looked just like him, but he was like a minister and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it wasn't a very good suspect. And, um, but yeah, I mean, the evidence was rather convincing. I mean, all the witnesses said, sure, that's the guy. Um, so that was sort of convincing, but you know, they found the real guy and he, yeah, they looked alike. And, um, you know, so in a way you say that's good evidence, but obviously wasn't good enough. And, you know, science is supposed to be something above all of this. You know, like they're supposed to be, um, you know, if, if, they're, if they have a weak conviction, they should just say it. Well, this is a weak conviction, okay, in the sense that we've drawn a conclusion. It seems pretty good, but we'll concede we don't really have the hard evidence yet. We don't have the videotape. Um, you know, we don't, we're, this is a little strained, you know, we're, 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 we're really putting this, you know, <laughs> we're, we're pushing, okay, the envelope and, uh, they don't really do that. They just jump to the conclusion, jump, 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 jump. And they jump with an absolute statement and then they do this whole ticker tape parade and it's not really the hero of the war, right? I mean, they got the wrong guy, you know, and the wrong theory. And, uh, and there, you know, you can make these arguments just showing that. And that's what I've learned in this process. I mean, I really didn't think physics was as broken, nearly as broken as, you know, I thought just this, the, the silly entanglement stuff. Okay. All of that seemed really wooey and seemed based on, well, you have to just trust us. We found, we saw the woo in an accelerator or something and you don't really get to see the evidence. You don't get to understand the evidence. You don't even get to understand the experiment. And then again, when you dissect some of these experiments, like the linear accelerator, you know, there's a huge um, flaw in the reasoning. You know, when the, when the particle's moving slow, they're measuring how much charge is hitting a surface. So they're measuring how charged it is, how many volts it's getting. And then all of a sudden they change the rules and say, well, we don't measure charge anymore. Now we're going to measure heat. Well, you know, heat can be created by ultraviolet light and x-rays and all this other stuff. So, you know. Are you really measuring electrons still? Or are you measuring all the crap that's pushing the electrons? You know, that's, you know, these all become very open questions when something changes and there's no real explanation for why we're changing the way we're measuring the energy. You know, when you automatically, you know, you suddenly change how you're, you know, I got a catcher's glove and then all of a sudden I change it into some other kind of glove. You gotta ask the question, why did you make that change? What's different? You know, what changed to cause the change? Um, what changed in the theory? You know, theoretically, the other system was supposed to work. How come it doesn't work anymore? Yeah. Those kind of obvious questions. All right. <clears throat>
Yeah, so that's what I'm... I mean, obviously, I could just write a single paper on a single subject. I could pick gravity or the photon thing or now the mv squared thing. Um, but the real point is, is all of it is suspect, and it's really a, an indictment of physics in general that it could be making these many things could be broken and wrong. And it is just true that if you can find, you can find where they did it once, you know, where they cheated the evidence, it's evidence that the, all the other stuff might also have cheats in it, you know, where they really did jump, literally, the evidence. They just didn't wait for the evidence to collect before they drew the conclusion. They got one tiny little grain of possibility and turned it into conviction. So all they had is, you know, I mean, a really weak piece of evidence. Uh, like, you know, he can't account for his whereabouts at the time of the crime. Therefore, he's guilty. You know, when, you know, 50% of the population might be in that position um, where they, there's no witnesses to where they were at that exact moment in time. Uh, so anyway, that would be a pretty lame conviction. And I'd argue that physics is full of those really lame um, moments where they decided something. I mean, they concluded something. And they really didn't have enough evidence to draw any conclusions. And they should have left the conversation a lot more open than they did. All right, so uh, physics, so the basic statement is physics isn't a very rigorous science. And there really isn't anyone... There's no authority. There's no supreme being, <laughs> you know, that's um, uh, oversight. There's no oversight of the process. You know, no system of credible defenders of the truth, so to speak, or something, to say you're cheating, you're cheating, you're cheating. So there's nothing, there's no judge conducting this trial. So it's sort of a, it's just for the, it's it's whatever works, whatever you can get away with, <clears throat> because there's no judge to say, you know, you can't sit there and mock the defendant, okay? You can't sit there and, you know, do a silly voice and, you know, do these kind of antics. That's not part of a fair trial, okay? It's mockery and all this other kind of crap. That's That has nothing to do with, you know, getting to the truth. Um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff... There has no, there's no authority to fix science, to force science to play by its own rules. I guess that's a good way to say it. Uh, and the substance of its structure is mostly make-believe. So the truth is, is that most of the facts that it has created, that is, the ones based on evidence, are suspect. A big, giant part of the physics is just wrong. I mean, the whole entanglement thing, the whole ESP particle thing, the whole wave thing... Uh, you know, all, it's all wrong. <laughs> you know, they're just wrong conclusions about how the thing functions. Why is this thing still moving? Creepy. Ghosts and such. Uh, anyway. Kinetic energy theory. Maybe it's an earthquake or something. Anyway. Uh, a rigorous science. So now I take the words out of that sentence. So that's the sentence. That's it. That's, the, that's my proposition. Physics isn't good science. And the fact is, it hasn't supported its conclusions with a volume of evidence. It is, and it's also, once it's drawn a conclusion, it's obnoxious to revisiting it. Another very unscientific approach. Um, and that it really hasn't duplicated its evidence. It hasn't substantiated its evidence. Um, and it certainly hasn't applied what you consider, you know, good scrutiny. It hasn't used a magnifying glass to look at the evidence carefully. You know, it's a distorted piece of glass. Um, and the end product is it's junk, mostly. Okay, so a rigorous science carefully collects evidence and performs a fair and open trial before it draws a conclusion. So it seems a, a fair argument that that's what a science should be, right? As an industry, it should have real controls. So if it was producing food, you want people to have controls. We want to have methods to prevent the employees from spitting in the food. You want to have, you know, all kinds of protections against, you know, dead rats getting in it and all kinds. You know, you want to do the best you can to prevent, protect, okay, the quality of your product. And science doesn't have anything 
you know, it doesn't have any of that structure. It's just some sort of theater performed, generally speaking, to seduce public interest and therefore public money. And it's kind of lost all its integrity as some kind of um, better process. And then even, you know, in the past, when that wasn't the influence, it was nationalism and all kinds of other stuff that uh, motivated scientists to one-up some other scientist and to play some sort of, um, you know, we're better than you game and all that kind of crap. And so it really got perverted by the existence of uh, science icons like Newton versus, uh, you know, Leibniz. Leibniz. Um, all right, so the basic idea is that it's got to have these these rules. So the scientists often cite that we have these rules. You know, that we do do these things. You know, repeat the experiment, all this other crap. And the facts are, no, they don't. They really don't apply those rules very rigorously. And clearly, the other argument I can make is that the scientists in performing experiments, they engineer the experiment. Okay, so they carefully take out any capacity for the experiment to give any kind of nuanced results where it might indicate that something else is a, playing a role. And so I've sort of argued that the Veritasium performance um, have those elements in it where he has engineered. I mean, I've caught him twice now, right? He did it with the block of wood getting shot by a bullet and didn't tell his audience that, yeah, each time I videotaped it, the block went a different height, you know, and I'm just averaging, you know, I'm playing some other, you know, he didn't even tell the truth about that. Um, and it's a kind of a critical to how he displayed the evidence. So he displayed it to maximize the impact of the facts in a way that's just totally dishonest, this useless science, broken. And then in the um, you know single photon double slit experiment thingy, uh, you know, he obviously didn't tell the audience that I couldn't get it to work. It didn't work when I did it in some sort of the rational way. So I had to turn the photo detector way up, way high, high, highest sensitivity. I was getting seven error photons a second. I had it turned up so, the amplifier turned up so high um, that I was getting feedback, essentially. And that's the only way I could get the experiment to work. So, you know, instead of just telling you the truth that, no, the results really don't match. And then, you know, look, you have the example, the, the, the recent Stephen Bro, you know, attack video where he does do three or four experiments, you know, does the experiment in different ways, does them all kind of sloppy. Um, and the truth is, is the best experiment he does proves me 100% correct. And he argues that somehow that's a broken experiment when in every way it's superior. I mean, you know, in every way it's, it's more reliable um, in terms of at least we have some certainty about what energy went in um, to the experiment. And, you know, we have a certain certainty about how well springs collect energy. <laughs> and um, anyway, so just an example of how that's the, what's broken here is a bunch of <clears throat> hatchet job, um, poorly motivated, um, um, <clears throat> non-scientific attitude people are controlling, okay, what people see. And again, in colleges, I was really surprised, right? All the Professor Lewin demonstrations are all demonstrations that were performed back in the 50s by MIT. So these are their out-of-the-box kind of experiments that they've, you know, done them repeatedly this way so they can, they, can be, they can rely on the fact that it won't tell somebody, well, maybe that's a wrong theory because they'll never be able to see what else happens, what happens when you change one of the variables and how the whole thing isn't so, um, their story doesn't make as much sense when they see the other things happening, the other things that will happen. Um, you know, for example, double slit experiments, you just depend, you know, start changing the distances and all of a sudden the theory doesn't work. The mathematics completely fails, um, you know, when you um, make the slits wider in the double slit experiment. You know, the, the, the young drawing doesn't work. It doesn't physically work. 
It doesn't mathematically work. It doesn't physically work. It doesn't, you can't draw it. You can't do anything with it because it doesn't work. It's not right. Um, the source of the waves is in the wrong place. And it's just a fact. And the fact that they don't even, you know, they won't tell you that, though. They don't say that when they're doing their lectures. Oh, well, Jung was right about the theory somehow, but his diagram is completely useless. They don't say that. Uh, they're just not, they're not telling the truth. They're not really doing this careful evidence collection and then careful analysis of the evidence. They are eager to support conclusions and to support um, a branch of their Catholicism, you know, that kind of thing. They're, they're in some um, war to um, defend theory rather than to find theory however you want to put it. Um, and like I said, <clears throat> I think you can be insanely biased but still be a good scientist and know I really think um, <clears throat> this is right, but you're fair and you say, yeah, but I want a fair, I want to win fair, okay? I want to hit my home runs, you know, with a real bat and I don't want to cheat, I don't want to have cork in it, I don't want to do all this kind of crap. I don't want to take steroids, I don't want to be a faker. So you can have a, you can have a player who's playing a real game, still has a bias, but he's playing a fair game. And it's just, I would argue that, as has sort of been demonstrated, that the physicists don't want the fair game. That, um, you know, as soon as they, they're all willing to talk to you when they can lecture you. But as soon as they find out that you might be interrogating their physics and interrogating their conclusions, they don't want to have anything to do with it. So they want to interrogate everybody else, but they don't want to be interrogated. And that's essentially the troll behavior. I mean, the trolls say nothing, they assert nothing, they defend nothing. <clears throat> all they do is attack. And that's all basically science does, is attack the rotten fruit, okay, that might be out there, uh, the flat earthers or the conspiracy theories, you know, the wackiest of them. But they won't, they aren't willing to go through the same scrutiny. They aren't willing to be attacked uh, internally and tested internally that whether their conclusions are valid. They don't even want to, you know, they don't even want a glimpse of it or they'll call you a pseudoscientist or, a, you know, they'll call you a um, anti-science. You know, they'll just label you uh, and think that you're um, doing something inappropriate by disagreeing. You're just not allowed to. All right, uh, the structure of physics includes, so you know, I'm highlighting words out of the original substance just to, I mean, the original statement. So there's two concepts here, rigorous, what's rigorous science and then what's structure of physics. And so I would argue that the structure of physics is these, you know, obviously some of the physics they can't mess up, okay? Some of the, you know, obvious experiments and stuff. But that's not, you know, so that's part of the structure is understanding the difference between up and down or left and right or even understanding there's three dimensions. So they get some of that stuff right. But again, they've broken much of it by all of this woo they've piled on top of it that um, somehow means, you know, because of Einstein, all of a sudden there's no such thing as something that's not moving in all of space. So I take all of the universe and in a way they're saying there's nothing that can't not be moving. There's no such thing as absolute motion, that somehow we've broken the real reality of the three dimensions. The three dimensions don't mean anything. Even though all the evidence indicates the three dimensions are really rigid and you can't get around it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna find your wormhole. You're not gonna find your interdimensional space travel. None of that stuff is gonna happen. It has just no realistic prospect because there really isn't any evidence that the three dimensions aren't rigid. And that things actually do have absolute motion. Yes, they have relative motion, but they also have an absolute motion. There are things that are really moving and things that aren't really moving. There's things, everything has a velocity in the three-dimensional space. I mean, right now we have a combination of motions and we're constantly being accelerated in a new direction because of the Earth's spinning, because the Earth is traveling around the Sun, because the Sun and the Earth are traveling through space. All of those motions add up to a, a motion that each one of our particles has to deal with. 
has to be part of as a system. And they haven't undone any of that as a physical fact, but they are talking as if they have some good evidence, some good reason to believe the universe isn't, the dimensions are sliding over each other somehow. And there's just no evidence of that. All right. Um, so I, I list the, the bullshit, some of it. Uh, these are the subjects, okay? So bent space-time would be the subject of gravity, okay? Superposition, wave, particle, duality, and entanglement would be the subject of what is a photon. And free kinetic energy is the more recent subject of how they have a fundamental formula, the kinetic energy theorem, right in the middle of their physics, and it's absolute nonsense. You know, remember the numbers, 128 versus 64,000 joules. A huge difference in the assessment of its energy and to be able to say that we can't figure out the truth here which one is right somehow there you know that we can't we can't find out we can't know that one of those numbers has to be wrong come on yeah we can know um, and they just don't want to know they don't want to change what is obviously was has it's terrible physics for its history um you know i've already been over all of that i mean it's just terrible physics and the fact that none of you will admit it you know is part of the problem here that it really is just religion i'm fighting another form of religion okay uh so then i go and a few hundred phantom particles so you know i haven't done much I uh, haven't made too many statements about that, but obviously I don't think there are neutrinos, and I don't think there are positrons, and I don't think there are k-mutons and k -k 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 whatever, all these other bullshit. But there's nothing, no role for them to play in an atom. They have no functional role. They can't be hiding somewhere because they don't do anything. The only time they show up is in an accelerator, supposedly. Um... I mean, you could say, okay, muons exist, but mu muons, you could argue, are just a pair of electrons. That it's nothing more complicated than one electron. It's like two cars on a racetrack drafting. You know, they're connected to each other still. The two electrons are connected. And that they have the same motion and being pushed by a common force. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole... So, yes, you, I can go into a whole thing on that, but I'm just saying, so... Uh, but yes, but all of these particles have very, very weak evidence, and certainly none of it um, is at all um, videotape evidence. None of it's hard genetic evidence. None of it is good evidence for conviction. It's all, they should have a big, giant question mark next to each one of those words saying, well, we're not too sure exactly what this is, or even if it exists. And that's clearly true with neutrinos. Obviously, neutrinos were just a consequence of their math not adding up. You know, their mv squared formulas that give us this tremendous amount of energy. Well, they weren't working in the atom uh, when they used this fake, this this not realistic notion of energy. And so neutrinos were a byproduct of, might be. I mean, it might actually be true that neutrinos are a byproduct of having the wrong kinetic energy formula. And that's all there are. They're, a, they're a, an error function. They're completely created out of trying to justify an error. Uh, trying to defend an error. Okay. Um, so good evidence collection. Well, okay, I should finish the other one. None of it defensible, defendable with any hard evidence. So again, and that's really sort of what the next, well, so a little further down says. Okay, so we'll wait till we get to it. Uh, good evidence collection doesn't force outcomes. So that's sort of the key first real, you know, being a good advocate. Like say if I became a lawyer, I wouldn't define my job as getting the guilty guy off, right? Even if I was a defense attorney, my job would be stop the prosecutor from cheating, okay? Give my client a fair trial. Don't give my client, don't let me pull some antics to get him off. That's not my job as an advocate. My advocate, my, I should be advocating for justice. Both lawyers should want justice. 
and instead they perverted that into some and, and they should just be there to be a cop they should be there to be a cop this cop is watching that cop and that cop is watching this cop that's what the attorney should be doing they should be watching for cheats by the other guy and that's all they shouldn't be cheating okay overtly trying to get a guy off um that's just bullshit <laughs> sorry um that's that's not a good system that's not what lawyers should be doing okay lawyers shouldn't be aggressively prosecuting and aggressively defending they should be aggressively fighting for justice and that the evidence be fairly collected and fairly presented that should be their both of their ambitions and apparently we've broken that and that's why our justice system sucks um so that's all we have in physics is the same we uh, we have obvious examples of of forcing the outcome um and Feynman would be in my opinion a very good example where he talks good physics and good scientific method but he didn't walk it at all because you could see from his analysis of photons and the double slit experiments again he called them the most meaningful you know the, these are the these are the experiments that show you the reason for quantum mechanics and yet he's his description of them was so far from the truth and so far from accurate both in terms of even just describing the simple outcome of the experiment as well as what experiments had even been performed so he couldn't even get what experiments were performed correct let alone describe the experiments that were performed correctly uh so clearly a bias towards an outcome um and just rotten science all right a good trial doesn't contain propaganda nor allow distorted views of evidence so that's exactly what the judge and the attorney should be trying to do is to make sure the process for the jury um is as fair as possible that every corner is you know watched and every make sure it isn't cut <laughs> you know that everything is understood so there can't be a, a um a wrong conclusion based on somebody propagandizing or faking or or not telling the whole truth you know leaving whole big pieces of the facts out of the trial hiding the evidence um only showing when it works never showing when it doesn't work all of that crap and clearly that's not a rule science gives a shit about and Feynman again is just a perfect example of you know make up fake experiments they didn't conduct they just thought experiments and then talk as if they were real experiments and you got real results and you proved it when you didn't even come close to doing any of that and then dismiss it as if you know we thought of all possible other suspects um you know we considered everybody we thought uh, we we tested everybody we asked everybody where they were at six o'clock on you know tuesday the 5th and everybody had an alibi except for this guy you know that's the sort of distortion they're providing like you know we really gave this a lot of thought we tested all possible alternative theories there can't be any other possible explanation but our explanation and Feynman does a lot of that hyperbole of of nothing else works we we tried this this and this and this is, and nothing works so it has to be this you know we have no other choice but to draw this wacky ufo conclusion This is just these are just facts in the record. I've played the videos. An honest man can see the dishonesty. You want to claim it doesn't exist, I then I can have there's no communication with you, right? You're just you're just um belligerently and fascistly um religious and nutty. Um because the truth is it's not good science and you should be able to say it. What Feynman did to photons wasn't good science. All right. um propaganda and distorted view so again <clears throat> so this would go to like Ken Wheeler and his ferro cell bullshit what you do when you're going to talk about it is you show what it looks like under a uh uh you know a microscope and and you show the facts and the facts are that it's not doing what it looks like it's doing yeah you know? and you point out that the LEDs are you know decisively positioned and that each LED is creating a reflected arc and that's these are all facts so you point those facts out to people so they can see what's causing the pattern 
and they can understand that oh well for every LED there's an arc over here and then this LED creates an arc over here and this LED creates an arc over here and if I put all those together they look like a little flower well yeah so what um, it's not bending the light it's not doing any of that stuff and it's happening because you're looking essentially at magnetic you're, you're, you're looking at iron filings at an angle and if you look at them you know instead of looking at them straight down you know and seeing the pattern you start tilting them you know and then you make them glitter you know light reflecting oh yeah all of a sudden I can create patterns that weren't there you can do it to paintings you can see things in a painting by tilting the painting you know things that you didn't know were there um, you know artists even hid things that way you know you can only see them when you look at the painting you know askew um, so this is a part of understanding physics and understanding the, the, the facts is to understand that yeah this really has a lot to be to, to do with us being fooled um, and we got to be really careful because it's really easy to fool people as Ken Wheeler demonstrates uh, you can do really bad experiments and get something to look like and it's not necessarily anything like all right um, so that's probably enough on so that's all you know you're saying here is this physicists should be really focused on the process this is a trial I'm gonna be a, if I'm the judge I'm gonna be a good judge if I'm an attorney I'm gonna be a good attorney and you know if I'm a defendant <laughs> or a, a, a prosecutor or, or yeah the prosecutor um, I, if I'm in favor of one of those two sides in winning because I have an impression I'm not going to let that impression bias me uh, out of being reasonable. I won't ignore the counter evidence and I won't ignore when my evidence is weak and be honest. And they just don't have any of that. All right, conclusions should be inescapable. That is, if you're going to make them like nobody reasonable can deny Einstein was right. Somehow we have to believe it. We're not being fair or reasonable to the evidence because it's so overwhelming. There's no other choice. We must believe Einstein was correct. Um, you know, that kind of crap. Uh, and so the real point would be is the scientist should um, weigh his conclusions based on the quality of the evidence that he's creating them out. Like I said, you can convict somebody of mass murder based on fingerprints and genetics. And in another case, you can have the videotape. Now, when you have the videotape, you can feel so much more secure. So you should just point out that, gee, this is a this is a 92 percenter, you know, conclusion versus a 99 percent conclusion. And I would argue that if they actually had to put those percentages on their conclusion, on the veracity of their evidence, it's really poor. I mean, what's the real evidence for the existence of a positron? You know, I mean, it's not that decisive. So, I mean, you know, what is it, 50%, 60 I mean, it's not a conclusion where you say, yes, we're certain of it. Because you don't have any, you can't, one of the biggest pieces against it is this: the fact that somebody can just ask the question, where are all the positrons hiding? What, where are they? You know, they're arguing there's just as many of them as electrons or something. I mean, there are supposed to be an antiparticle for every particle. Well, where are they all? dark matter I mean, you know, it's it's just <laughs> they can't be dark matter because you know they have properties and you can't have properties and be a you know and be dark matter because dark matter only has one property it makes gravity it doesn't do anything else I mean these are you know on their face these are things that people you know what is the veracity of dark matter as a theory I mean what evidence created this conclusion and the argument is the evidence is just about non-existent. The evidence is, well, some of our other conclusions can't be right unless we invent this crap. What the hell is this doing? Stop it. I guess I was doing it somehow. All right. The Eddington experiment had marginal... Okay, so now I'm starting to go into the, each one of the subjects. So I just decided to start writing some of the evidence why Einstein hasn't even... You know, in no way is it overwhelming evidence. So a key ingredient to Einstein's success with his theory was the Eddington experiment. That was the big headline. That's what made him famous. That's when all the reporters showed up. 
Uh, that's why when Einstein became a public figure of stature and, uh, you know, ticker tape parade time and all that kind of crap. And it was really marginal. And that's just a fact. It's a really marginal, it, 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 even if it was done very well and they had very good weather and they had very good, you know, it was still a difficult experiment. They had lousy weather. They got one-tenth of the quality of product out of the experiment one tenth of what they were expecting i mean it was really poor um a really challenged experiment and then there's all kinds of in hindsight lots of speculation uh there is some evidence there's good reason to believe that um this wasn't very good science in the sense that they wanted the conclusion and they basically excluded all the pieces of evidence that were contrary to the conclusion and just kept the evidence that was positive and um that's just like the first rule of you just broke science that's you know that's committing the the molestation trespass you know you're not babysitting you're molesting kind of thing <laughs> or whatever you cross the line from being a science do-gooder to being a religion bad doer you know bad doer and uh, that's all over the Eddington experiment. And although Eddington says in his own journal, I wouldn't stake my life on these results, he didn't say that, okay, when he published his results. He didn't include that fact. And right there, not even including that fact in his testimony of what these results were, was all part of the fact that uh, they, they hyped this whole thing. And it was all hyped, okay? They, they made theater out of it, um, you know, they knew the results, they waited to announce them in a special way, and Einstein was there with other people waiting for the results. I mean, it was all a staged pile of crap. Anyway, um, so, and then the other fact that was in Einstein's favor was when we were able to make clocks and move them fast, um, we found they broke. Well, obviously, we can see that with regular clocks. You know, you can't make a clock that's unbreakable. So that should be the first thing going in. You should say is there's no clock I can't break by moving it or jiggling it or making it cold or making it too hot. No matter what the clock is, I can break it. I can force it not to tell time very well. And the assumption was that somehow atomic clocks are indestructible when we already know they're perfectly destructible. I just put them in a, a bucket of uranium and they're not going to work anymore. They're not going to, they're, they're destroyed as a clock. They're not going to tell time right anymore. I make them very hot or I make them very cold. I also change uh, what time they tell. So atomic clocks are very subject to being broken. So the fact that velocity breaks clocks, again, you can understand that that would be true of a pendulum clock. That would be true of lots of things I can break with velocity. It's not going to tell time anymore. I mean, a pendulum clock will you know, never tell time again. If I move the pendulum you know, at the right speed, it'll just keep going that way. <laughs> you know, because I'm not allowing it to do its thing. I'm, I'm preventing it from um, changing its gravitational position. Um, but anyway, so it just maintain its velocity and just keep going that way. Uh, but anyway... Um, so I can break them all. You know, so nothing, it shouldn't be some kind of startling, oh, this couldn't possibly happen unless Einstein's right. What a prediction of Einstein. Well, it's not really that much of a prediction, right? So we really don't have any great evidence that a warping of the dimensional space is what's causing the clock. The clock's actually telling right time. Somehow it's not the fact that it's being forced to move that's breaking it. So anyway, I ain't really have to. In future, I will uh, fig figure out how to move over a little bit, I guess. Anyway, um, okay, so that's probably uh, enough um, of a video and such. And uh, so, you know, I got a lot of writing to do. I really don't want to do it. I'm just not... Just don't have any. Again, this argument should be. We should be able to make it in. It should be able to make it publicly, and we should be able to make it in the form of 
uh, interaction. And it's just disappointing that the internet doesn't have that functionality. <laughs> I mean, it used to, but it just doesn't anymore. Nobody has an obligation to um, engage criticism. And that's pretty bad. Like I said, some of it I, I concede. Um, when the criticism is just about, mm, you know, your hairstyle uh, or your lifestyle choices, then yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, that kind of criticism is totally useless. Um, yeah. All right. So, uh, it's, yeah, this has been. A, I could play some of the other guy, but it's just, you know, it's no, I mean, you know, just this, the, the whole hype about Einstein. So I could just go through some of that, but it was, you know, it doesn't have that much value because it all is just hype. It's so obviously hypey that uh, somebody who has any kind of sympathy with my argument really doesn't need to hear it, <laughs> you know, because they already know that, oh yeah, these people can get very hypey. All right, so till the next time and such, uh, this has been a Draft Science video presentation. Thank you for your attention and such.